Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Test Tubes and Cauldrons, a podcast where we talk about the intersection of science and spirituality. So in this episode, we are going to attempt to explore a very complicated subject, which is the science behind words and symbolism. But before we get into that, I'm going to pass it over to Felicity, who's going to do our What Happened on This Day. And our current day recording is June 26th. So Fel, go ahead and take it away. All right. So in 1721, the first smallpox inoculations in America were given in Boston by Dr. Zabdiel Boylston when a smallpox epidemic struck Boston. A Massachusetts reverend, Cotton Mather, who lived in Boston, had previously heard from an enslaved person of the practice being used in Africa. Of all the doctors Mather had urged to try it, Zabdiel Boylston was the first doctor courageous enough to use the procedure very pertinent to our state of the world right now. But pertinent to this episode, a little other fun little what happened on this day was the first barcode in 1974 was scanned in at a supermarket. The company that I work for is actually the one who developed the barcode that we use in stores. So fun fact. Yeah, it was wild. I found that out and I was like, huh, that's so weird. Yeah, so we're going to talk about words and symbolism kind of in the spiritual sense of like using sigils. But before we get into that, Fel, I think you have a whole bunch of history here that I'm excited to hear about. Yes, brief history of sigils and symbols. I'm mostly going to be talking about sigils rather than just symbols, because in order to talk about the history of like just magical symbols or spiritual symbols, I'd we'd be here all day. You'd have an entire podcast dedicated to just symbols. So The history of sigils as we know them today can be traced roughly to the late Middle Ages, but know, however, that magical symbols in general date back to antiquity, and I'm pretty sure they found evidence of the Neolithic age of what they would expect to be some sort of magical symbol. The sigils that we think of uh, today were used for evocation and invocation of a particular entity. They were used in, in what was a type of ceremonial magic at that time and not really used in folk magic. Folk magic would be more just general magic symbols. These sigils in particular are strongly traced to the Lesser Key of Solomon, which was, while it was compiled in the 17th century, has some sections that they think potentially date back to the 14th century. Sigil, in this case, is uh, Latin for seal, the seal being a pictorial signature of some entity, in the case of the Lesser Key of Solomon, a demon. Also around this time is when we see sigils appear in Kabbalah in the seminal text, Sefer Raziel Hamalak. I apologize for my horrible pronunciation there, but it cont- it was a, a very prominent text that contained elaborate angelology, magical uses of the zodiac, protective spells, and ways to create amulets, as well as sigils. So a little bit later, Agrippa outlined occult uses for an old concept in mathematics known as magic squares. Magic squares are where each array of numbers in a row, column, and diagonal equals the same sum. If you're a Sudoku fan like me, this idea might make sense to you. While Sudoku is not considered a magic square, the idea is very similar, and I feel like it's a good way for you to wrap your head around it, since this is an audio medium and I can't exactly draw a magical square for you. There's quite a lot of debate on when the first uh, datable magic square was written, though from what I can see, it almost seems to be an example of multiple discovery with various parts of the world making their first one around the same time, being the 9th or 10th century CE. There are some examples of magic squares on older documents. However, it's unclear if they are actually from that time or many historians think that this is the case, that they were added later. So Agrippa was drawing upon several occult philosophers and texts that predated him. These 15th century manuscripts use magic squares in tandem with planetary magic to create angelic and demonic sigils. Agrippa's magical square is also called Kameyas. I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce that. Yeah, it's called a Kamea. Kamea, thank you. Yeah, you're <laughs> So Kameyas are a number of squares, a three to nine. That's like how many squares are in each row and column. Uh, each one is associated with one of the astrological planets. Uh, he pulled uh, a lot from Pythagorean numerology, although sometimes I've seen Chaldean. So a letter is assigned to a number in Pythagorean numerology. This is one through nine. The, scu- the square was then carved into a metal that corresponded to that planet, and the sigils were drawn by drawing a line between numbers until the image revealed itself. I truly struggle to find a concrete discussion on how, but know that sigils drawn in the manner that we see them today 
uh, using these Kamea squares was then further developed in the Western esoteric tradition, including that of the Golden Dawn. But really the next like big breakthrough in sigils came from A.O. Spare, which is kind of funny that this episode is coming right after our Chaos Magic episode. This method is starkly different than that of the Keys of Solomon and Agrippa. The method was really outlined very intensely in Peter J. Carroll's Libra Null and Psychonaut, which are very prominent books on chaos magic. But these methods relied on creating monograms or simplifying an image down until it is abstracted and no longer recognizable. The sigil is then charged, usually by destruction, or entered into the subconscious via a trance state. Here's a quote from the book Austin Osmond Spare by Phil Baker. The big difference with Spare's method was that he dispensed with pre-existing esoterica and external beliefs. So the sigils were no longer for controlling traditional demons, angels, and what have you, but instead for controlling forces in the unconscious psyche of the individual operator. Also a quote from Psychonaut pertaining to this. Uh, There are three parts to the operation of a sigil. The sigil is constructed. The sigil is lost to the mind. The sigil is charged. At this point, we see sigils as having three potential meanings, a magical symbol used for a multitude of purposes, the signature of an entity used in summoning, or an image used to create a desired effect within your own subconscious. So that's the kind of convoluted history of sigils that I tried to make into something comprehensible. Today, we're mostly going to be talking about sigils from the chaos magic perspective, but you will also see the Kamea squares fairly regularly. Usually not well explained, but you will see them. (laughs) Not well explained at all, ever. (laughs) I remember, I this is a total sidebar, I just remember messaging Astra and being like, how do sigils work? I can't find them explained anywhere. And you like explained it a little bit to me, but I was like, but where are these coming from? Like I couldn't, I didn't know that it was Pythagorean numerology. I didn't know where these squares were coming from. And I just mostly saw people doing Saturn squares. And I was like, I don't understand what is happening here. And most people, it seems, also did not understand what was happening. Yeah, it's it's sometimes frustrating because a lot of people, so the classical, like if you type in like sigil method online, um, the first thing that comes up is this like picture and it has the Saturn Kamea on it. And they're like, yeah, like, you know, write out your intention, like put it into the the numbers and then like use this square to, to do your sigil design and nobody knows that it's the Saturn Kamea which is so funny to me there is like a whole bunch of other commands that you can use for the different planets if you want to incorporate them into your working then also like the method of going from your intention like to the numbers using Chaldean or like Pythagorean numerology that's also not something that people know about we'll probably get into this later but like there's really two different methods of designing sigils that I've like heard of One is more, I guess, emotion and like symbolically invoked. So you design a sigil based on like what certain things mean to you. So if you were going to do something about like being protected, you might utilize a shield in your sigil. Whereas most of the sigils that like I do are more based on like the cameos. So it's calling in the aspects and the characteristics of a particular planet by using the cameo to like charge my attention, I guess you could say. But yeah, I think we'll get into our personal uses later. So let's hop into the science behind images and our subconscious. So Hanny and I were doing a lot of research for this episode. I think we both came to the conclusion that it's complicated. It's super complicated. Hanny, what do you think? Yeah, I would certainly agree with that conclusion. I've put a giant message in our outline in uh, Red Comic Sans just to uh, uh, just to drive home that message. So I think we can kind of address this from numerous different fields, like the idea of memory and how concepts are enshrined into memory because that's really key to the idea of like a chaos magic sigil right like you're supposed to sort of forget about the sigil in some way it's it's consigned to the subconscious so it can act and how concepts are enshrined into memory has been addressed by loads of different fields so there's linguistics you've got the concept of semiotics um science signified and signifiers you have schemata in anthropology which is this idea of concepts which are consolidated into memory which might be collected or it might also be individual. And that also kind of bleeds into more psychological theories of mind. So I think f- for this episode, we'll focus on more of the kind of psychological and neurochemical because that's closer to what we know, I would say. And something that really p- jumped out to me as maybe pertaining to sigils was this concept of um, an amodal versus a perceptual 
a symbol. So I don't know if you guys have heard about this at all before, but basically it's different theories behind how concepts are consolidated into memory. So an amodal symbol is an incomplete representation of something which allows you to draw up a complete representation from memory. So maybe like a 2D image of a table and you see that image and you're able to bring up that whole kind of sensory experience into your mind of the table. Or likewise, the word chair, it's not it doesn't show you a chair, but you can see the word chair and you can think about the chair and feel what it would be like to sit in the chair just by seeing the word. So I guess I thought that sigils might be adjacent to this concept where you kind of flatten a, an idea um, into a, a simple symbol and then you can draw a complex representation in the subconscious. That being said, the idea of amodal versus perceptual um, symbols is quite debated in psychology. There's not much empirical evidence for the existence of amodal symbols, and it's heavily debated whether there's actually a meaningful difference between an amodal, which is um, the symbol-based framework I mentioned, or a perceptual framework, which is more to do with your kind of how your experience draws up that memory. But I still think it's interesting to discuss the frameworks because from a chaos magic perspective, at least for me, I think that it's quite a good analogy, even though it's, it's heavily debated in psychology. I still think that it's interesting and useful um, because the idea of this amodal symbol kind of gives us a framework to imagine a, a sigil from, right? It's a flattening of a particular concept and it allows you to draw a draw a really complex concept into a very simple symbol. So I was doing a lot of research kind of into like some neurochemical pathways and like neuropsychology and physiology. And from what I was reading, it seems like symbolism is really heavily dependent upon like a contextual framework. So symbols, including the shape of letters that like in a language, those are symbols. Their meanings stem from pre a pre-existing framework that we then attempt to fit them into. And there were a couple of experiments that I want to touch on performed by some people who looked into this. And one of them was an experiment performed by... I think it's pronounced Zhu and colleagues. And they took the elements of a narrative and they presented them as either isolated words, single sentences, or a small part of that narrative. And when they did this, they demonstrated that as the words were embodied in an increasingly complex context, so moving from the word by itself to the sentence to the narrative, the part the number of parts of the brains that were involved in the processing grew. So for a single word, something called the Wernix area, which is considered to be a low-level language area, was included. But when you added sentences, that included then the Wernix area plus the Broca's area, which is in the inferior frontal gyrus, as and that's considered like a classical language area. And then if you went even further to the narrative, it evoked all of the previous areas of the brain, in addition to the um, medial prefrontal cortex and the tempo, tempo parietal cortex, which is an area, actually both are areas that aren't associated with linguistic processing, which I found really interesting. And it suggests that the more complex we get with a particular symbol, the more areas of the brain we have to engage in order to try and find kind of a way to associate and process the information. And that's also curious to consider when you think about sigils, is where does that kind of fall within that level of complexity? Is it something that maybe falls closer to like the single word origin where we're only engaging a very like a singular or maybe one or two parts of the brain? Or is it something that's more complex because it's in sim like symbol form? There were also a couple of studies that show that motion verbs, so things like running and walking and eating, elicit activity in motion areas of the brain. So the finding was that changing the target of a sentence, actually this is in association with this, but like utilizing motion verbs, if you also change the target of a sentence from concrete to abstract, there was a shift in brain activation from a spatial navigation pattern to a language-like pattern. Essentially saying that if we have two sentences, one is the man goes into the house, which is an action verb, going, moving, and then the house, which is a concrete target, Versus the sentence, the man goes into politics, goes again being motion verb, politics being more of like an abstract concept, it showed a shift in this brain activation from the spatial navigation pattern with the concrete object, the house in this case, 
to a language-like pattern when we're talking about politics. Again, kind of showing this difference between the complexity of what we're looking at having an effect on what areas of the brain are actually activated. Furthermore, (laughs) there was another experiment by Widman and colleagues that examined what happened when the convention for symbolic representation was broken. This was a really interesting study. They exposed participants to a high pitch and a low pitch sound. And immediately prior to each sound, a bar would flash on the screen and that bar would indicate whether they're going to hear a low pitch or a high pitch. So essentially they showed a low bar for the low pitch and they showed a high bar for the high pitch. And every now and then they caused a mismatch between the symbol, the bar, and the sound. So a high versus a low pitch. And this led to a very specific neuronal signature that arose. And it led to an interesting discussion of cross-modal interaction, essentially how a stimulus in one sensory domain sets up an expectation in another sensor, sensory domain. And there's another paper, which I'll link below, that argued that symbols represent condensed pieces of knowledge that aren't an analog, but instead function as an argument within a framework of transformation that realizes predictions. That essentially, what that's essentially saying is that it functions as kind of an argument based in a known framework, a pre-existing framework within your mind of transformations that then realizes a particular outcome an action that you need to take, or some form of recognition. And I thought, when I read that, I was kind of thinking back to the purpose of this episode, because I was getting way too deep in the neuropsychology of everything. And I was thinking back to how it all kind of related to sigils. And this this cross-modal interaction makes a lot of sense in my mind, especially depending on how you design your sigils. And I think this is something that fits more with the sigil design, where you base it off of, like, images that have a representation, like a meaning to you. So the people who like to use sigils as that suggest particular meaning and provide like a familiar context, then that leads to an expectation of what the sigil is about. So like visually speaking, you engage an expectation from it. That could be how they work. Even thinking about it linguistically, when you design a sigil from a statement of intent, and those words are then put into a particular context with symbols. So kind of like I was saying earlier, if your intent is protection, and the symbol for that is a shield, then you're engaging both the linguistic representation, which causes you to consider and think about a symbol. And then that symbol, when you see it later, will also kind of go back and connect to like the linguistic meaning. So I thought that was kind of interesting, connecting Siddle design to some of these studies of how the brain works and the different parts of the brain that are activated. But what do you all think about that? That was a lot of information. (laughs) So I'm sorry. I think the sticking point for me with this is that we have to consider the subconscious and the charging the sigil. Like Phil mentioned, you the, the sigil is, is lost to the mind, right? And then it's charged. So how does that work with our framework? If we're creating an expectation, is that is that a conscious expectation? Is it subconscious? Like how does that manifest in the brain? And also when we're charging it, for example, I think Psychonaut refers to using something like laughter or a trance state. That's not really something that I think has been investigated very thoroughly, but that could potentially affect how things are encoded into memory. So I think it's interesting to think about this cross-modal activation, but if we're essentially having to forget about something, how does that kind of correlate? Do you see see what I'm saying? I'm not sure I'm making a a particular point. I do, but I think the other question is whether we actually forget it. Because even we say that we make a sigil, then you forget it, and like that's how it manifests. But I'm not entirely convinced by that like idea. I really don't think that we ever truly forget what a sigil means. You might forget the exact sentence that you you know, sense of intent that you originally derived it from. But like, I know, like, I have a bunch of sigils in my grimoire that like, I write down after I use them, I don't write down their meaning or what they were for. But I can go back through that and be like, Oh, I remember this was generally for this, like, this was generally for this, like, I use this for this. And so I have a select number of like, protection sigils, I don't remember exactly what they were all for, like, they all had very specific purposes. But I remember that they were for protection because when I look at them, they bark like a recognition of sorts. And so I think when you design sigils, this idea of like forgetting them, I don't really think it is like a true forgetting completely of them, at least in my experience. It's more of a forgetting the specific meaning behind them, which maybe prevents any kind of like 
barrier as to their manifestation. Belle, what do you think? My understanding from what I've read about sigils, and I, I've read some of Libra Nola and Cycle Nat, my takeaway was that it wasn't about like truly forgetting, but it was about your active mind forgetting, like your ego mind, not to, not to use the <laughs> those <laughs> words that I hate but I mean that that's basically what it I mean there is a difference between like your conscious and your subconscious so my understanding was it was about getting the brain to like yeah like you said like uh, not remembering the sentence that you put in like I've done sigils before and I remember the gist of what the sigil was uh, and it wasn't until I was going back and like rereading through my grimoire thing, Book of Shadows, whatever. And I was like, oh, wow, that I, I was like, that was the sentence I used. <laughs> I thought it was like something completely different. So I knew what generally what the, the idea of it had been, but I had forgotten entirely what the sentence was. It's not about truly forgetting that it's about the main mind, the big brain, forgetting and entering instead into this subconscious level. So this is a really big question, but how do you think then that the charging and the trance work associated with sigils, how do you think that interacts with memory? Do you think that there's something special about that which allows our brains to um, manifest them in the subconscious in a particular way? Or is do you think it's it's not really something that you can put down to bio biology? The idea of charging sigils has always confused me because I feel like people say charge and they mean like seven different things. Generally, it's like destroyed, but I've also seen it like I think in Psychonaut they they even or Libra and Psychonaut they talked about like listening to a song of like high emotional intensity when you're and like look at the sigil. I guess the idea is to have a big enough reaction of some kind in which that is like a, a big moment that sticks in your brain and like implants it into your subconscious. I mean, it's, I don't know. So when, when you see something really moving or really emotional, it doesn't just stick in your conscious brain. It works its way into the subconscious. So I think that's the general idea behind that, in my opinion. But I think usually people mean destroy... But from what I actually was reading in Libra Null and Psychonaut, that that's not actually always necessary. Yeah, I noticed that um, laughter, like you said, an intense emotional thing. So laughter was something that was often used to kind of just, I guess, almost clear your mind of it. Uh, but also, yeah, I can imagine that that intense emotional stimulus, maybe that um, sort of increases the uh, semantic processing. Sorry, I'm probably misusing psychology words right now. I apologize. <laughs> But yeah, that, that that does make a lot of sense to me that it's it's a very intense experience which kind of encodes it further down into your subconscious. I think in many ways, making a sigil in a trance state can kind of remove like distractions and help you really solidify like what the sigil is for. I think that's maybe where the trance state becomes really like useful. It's because you've you quieted your mind of distractions, so it really lets you kind of hone in on this is what I need. And when you design it, you might actually design a sigil that is maybe doesn't have the same kind of familiarity that it would if you did it outside of a meditative state because you've kind of quieted everything else the normal kind of thoughts and observations that would be flowing through your mind um, on like a day-to-day -day basis so I have to, I actually don't really design my sigils in a trance state I I've never really done it that way, um, but it might be worth trying and seeing how they turn out different. And maybe in that case, when you forget them, it really is more of like a true forgetting um, unless you get back into that state and you can access kind of the same place that you originally designed it. That'd be an interesting thing to experiment with. The next question is whether there is a biochemical or a cellular mechanism underpinning the relationship between symbols and memory. And how can we explain the utilization of the subconscious? And again, I kind of want to reiterate here that memory is complicated. <laughs> and really, a lot of the studies that have come out about the brain and memory, are it's, it's a very new field. And it's a field that doesn't have a whole lot of evidence for it. Everything we're saying, like, could change in the future as we learn more through, like, you know, more bio 
neurological scans and other technology that's being developed. But this is kind of what we know now. So that's what we're going to chat about. Yeah, so you found this really interesting review, right? And it's about um, the neurochemical and neurological localization of semantic processes. Um, But before we get into the review, I maybe wanted to discuss the methods a little bit so we can actually explain what we mean. Because we've talked a lot about brain activation and we use a technique called MRI for that. So it was specifically functional MRI. So do you maybe want to explain what MRI is, what it does? So if you're in the chemical field, you might be really familiar with something called nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And it's something that's very similar to that um, with a couple of differences. So in atoms, you have positive, like protons, neutrons, and electrons, right? Like those are the three kind of subparticles that make up an atom. Protons have a specific spin. And <clears throat> these spins mean that they spin in a particular direction and they cause a particular like field. In MRIs, what happens is a specific magnetic field is applied and it causes these protons to then change their direction to be in line with that magnetic field. When the protons are in line with that magnetic field, then the person who's like running the MRI machine sends a um, radio frequency through like the protons essentially and it causes them to rotate against this magnetic field. So they'll go like 90 to 180 degrees against it. And then when that radio frequency is stopped, the protons will return back to um, the position where they're in line with the magnetic field. And that return um, then causes the distribution of electromagnetic particles. And the rate at which those particles are released is kind of what helps you determine which tissue you're looking at, what area of the body that you're in. That way we can tell like we're looking at the liver or we're looking at the lungs or, you know, whatever. But that's generally how it works. So it's all about the return of the proton from the angle against the magnetic field back to the actual magnetic field and the release of those electromagnetic magnetic particles. That's how that works. Did I miss anything? I think that was a decent explanation. No, I think I think that's really good. So specifically the um, kind of MRI that they typically use for these studies, because we're looking at something something that colloquially referred to as brain activation, but like what is brain activation? In the context of an fMRI, um, we're specifically looking at metabolic effects. So usually what we'll look at is deoxygenated hemoglobin. So hemoglobin, as you probably know, is the a protein that carries oxygen in our blood. So when it's deoxygenated, what it's telling us is lots of oxygen is being taken up by that area of the brain. So we can say, okay, this area is more active because it's metabolizing more, it's respiring more. But there are some limitations to this. So although it's useful to say, okay, this, this part of the brain is being heavily used, is that definition of activity really helpful? Does it does it actually tell us very, very much about the way we're kind of synthesizing um, different parts of the brain? The resolution also matters. So when you actually incorporate the data together, basically you have to apply some kind of smoothing effect and that can actually have really profound effects on how the data are interpreted. Um, there are actually some studies that have referred to fMRI as neophrenology, which is quite a derisive uh, review. I don't know that I would go that far, but I do think it's very easy to say activation without really realizing what we're talking about. So just bear that in mind. When we're, when we're talking about activation, we're talking about respiration in particular parts of the brain, but that doesn't necessarily mean activation in one part means one particular function is turned on. It's a little bit more complicated than that. But back to our original review, um, I thought it was really, really interesting. So there are some examples like um, how odor words like cinnamon were associated with activation in the olfactory cortex, which is associated with smell more than control words are. So again, it kind of goes back to what you were saying about different regions of the brain associated with particular tasks activated. So that kind of shows a a level of subconscious memory. And we could maybe bring that back to sigils. Like it would be really interesting to see whether an actual sigil that somebody created, how that would affect the activation in their brain. Something I did want to mention, though, is that the results can be quite heterogeneous. So the studies in fMRI tend to be quite small because they uh, it's quite an expensive technique to apply. And sigils are obviously very highly individualized. Um, and secondly, there's also a cultural impact, which we haven't really discussed yet. But I found some studies suggesting that um, in Chinese patients versus English patients um, are struggling with dyslexia, they show different results in fMRI. So this suggests that the way that we process language and the way that we process symbols, um, including deficiencies in the way that we process those symbols, it varies per culture. And maybe that um, makes it a little bit difficult for us to make universal conclusions about how sigils work and how the brain processes symbols, because we haven't really applied this, this kind of cultural difference. 
Yeah, I think it'd be interesting to look at this from a cultural context. I read a paper, um, I didn't link it, but I will go find it again. And they did something where they, they compared the activation of different brain areas using fMRI again. And they looked at words that were similar in sound, words that were similar in how they appeared on the page, and also words that were similar in like what they actually were. So like two animals or like two fruits and so on and so forth. And what they found was that the words, even in different languages, the words that were similar, that looked similar on paper, so visually, and that sounded similar audibly, people were better. So similar areas of the brain were activated, even though they were different languages. And also that people were able to more readily recognize that this word might be associated with X thing based on the similarities, which I thought was really interesting. So I definitely think there probably is differentiation between cultures just because of the cultural differences and how that affects like people individually and the way that they're raised and the things that they are, you know, raised to think are normal and just even their associations. Like we know they're different between like Eastern and Western traditions and philosophies. Um, and so those are going to have an impact on kind of the symbolism that you bring to your occult practice. But yeah, even then, there seems to be some level of recognition cross-culturally and activation in the brain if there is some similarity, which is also really interesting. I've seen this in a couple of studies that we were looking at, um, or that I was looking at at least. But this is also something we encountered with our meditation and mindfulness episode, which is that a lot of these studies happen in people who have some kind of disease of some sort that maybe alters their psyche and the way that their brain works. And so when we refer to a lot of these studies, especially ones that use a disease model as kind of their either control group or part of their their experimental group, we need to keep in mind that these diseases can actually alter how their brain works. And so it might appear to be something significant when in reality it's just a side effect of a particular disease, which complicates this kind of study even further um, and just makes it, again, really difficult to say yes or no, this is what's happening. Kind of like we alluded to at the very beginning. (laughs) Memory is complicated and we really don't know a lot about it. And especially when it comes to like how the brain works and how neurons are connected, the regions of the brain, this crosstalk, it's not something that's been defined because we just really don't know a whole lot about it. So yeah, take these studies with a bit of a grain of salt. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I was in college and I was doing uh, studies, like, you know, the psych students do studies. And every time I got disqualified because for anything that involved an MRI, because I was a preemie, anytime, uh, even if I like no other problems because I was a preemie, it automatically disqualified me. So yeah, we don't know a whole lot about the brain and anything can affect it. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. I just Googled and it says that around 9.8% of babies are born premature in the USA. So that would be excluding about, you know, 10% of the population, which really, it just tells you something about study design. Like it makes sense that they would because they want to exclude um, abnormal effects. But yeah, it tells you a lot about how um, we kind of neglect swathes of our population when we're trying to normalize studies. So let's maybe transfer them from all of the science and the brain activation. Um, I'm sure what we've given you enough information to make your brain actually hurt. So let's talk about how we use sigils in um, our personal practice. So do you both use sigils like as Hellenic practitioners? Like, I don't know if that's something that's really common for you or? No. (laughs) So I'm not very much used to it. Um, But I'm interested to hear how you use sigils because it's something I haven't really dived into very much. So I do, <laughs> guys, I'll show you the, the, the difference between two people who are relatively in the same paradigm. I use the Kamea method with the Pythagorean numerology. I don't do it often. The only times that I have used sigils, for example, I did a charm on my transit pass and or like an old transit pass that I had. And I drew like a sigil on it to just basically be like, please may the train go fast (laughs) and may it not like break. Uh, And so when I use that, yeah, I don't know. I just carry it with me. So that's one of the ways that I use sigils. Yeah. I, I use, I use them the very, very infrequently. I use sigils a lot (laughs) in my practice, but mostly just because it's so easy. 
to like use them. For instance, I was actually talking about some of the Discord servers that we're in, but I have a sigil that I stick underneath my like a Tupperware container that I keep my coffee beans in. <laughs> and it's a sigil that I designed on a Sunday during the hour of the sun. And I remember the intent being something around like bringing forth energy for the day, working with the coffee to like provide that. And I had sigils a lot for that kind of thing. I also recall back when I worked in the food industry, <laughs> I really hate people who come in when it's like five minutes before close, right? And you're just like, get out, please. <laughs> and so I had a sigil that I created. There was like one day, I had like five people do this. And I was just like, no, I'm done. We're not doing this anymore. And so I created a sigil around invisibility that essentially the gist of it was like, the building is invisible after X time. People who have the desire, it's like change of something else or they like just the the building and kind of the restaurant itself was just like in, invisible to them and they would go in search of something else. It worked surprisingly well. <laughs> I taped it above like the doorway of the restaurant and where nobody ever cleans, you know, nobody ever cleans the top of the middle door. And it worked surprisingly well. Yeah, I didn't have many people come in at like right before close or if they did, it was like 20 minutes before close and that's better. I'm okay with that. So yeah, that kind of like it works surprisingly well. And then in most of my spell work, I usually do sigils um, like the planetary intelligences and the spirits, those all they all have sigils um, associated with them. And they're all designed on the planetary commands. So I utilize those quite frequently. And kind of like I mentioned earlier, if I am using a sigil in a working, it really depends on what I'm doing. Like I don't always do this. It just, if I think it fits the bill better than like a petition, I'll do a sigil. But I always design it on a planetary command, the one that's like corresponding with what I'm doing. Um, the one of the day, sometimes I'll actually do the sigil on the Kamea of the planet that I'm working with on the hour. So like when we're talking about planetary days and hours, each day of the week is associated with the planet. And then during the day, you have hours also associated with the planets. A lot of times when you do a working, you can do it on one day under one planet. And then you can also, and that's like the main characteristic or energy that you want to invoke. And then you can also do it during a particular hour. And that is like also kind of sprinkled into the spell, like those characteristics too. And so sometimes if I want the planet that I'm use, utilizing in the hour to have kind of more of a influence in my spell, I'll actually design the sigil on that command just to give it more of like a boost and an influence in what I'm doing. That's really how I use it. I don't really do the method of like designing a sigil based on kind of what I think about, like the whole protection, uh, the image of a shield. That's not how I utilize them. Um, because I think when I design them on the Kameas and like I draw them out on it, it almost just like charges it with the planet's power. And that's more of what I want. But yeah, that's how I use it in my practice. I use them quite frequently. I have them everywhere. <laughs> I have one in my car to assist with travel. I have a couple in like my, my bathroom, my shower to assist with glamour magic. Some things in my kitchen again to like bring energy and like joy. When I clean, I wash my windows. I typically like have a wash that I generate myself with like specific correspondences and then I'll draw sigils on my windows before like I wipe them in for protection. So I guess neither of you really use the kind of chaos magic technique where you sort of abstract a concept so it's like when you kind of draw um, letters from a word and then you cross them out etc but what do you think of the more sort of modern sigil wheels so you've mentioned using the Kameas but I'm talking about something which is I would say it's kind of adjacent it's like where you've got this wheel and um it has uh, letters on it, and then you basically spell out your word by connecting up the letters, and um, that generates a sigil. What do you think of this? Because that's something that I haven't tried either, um, but it seems to be very, very popular, especially with um, kind of newer practitioners. That's actually how I started using sigils. So when I first got into magic, like that was the method that I used. I would like write out my intention, cross out the vowels, cross out the double letters, and then whatever you have left is what you use to design the sigil. Um, I still do that sometimes, not quite as frequently. It, I think it works. And in many ways, actually, if you do it that way, I think sometimes it's easier to remember what the sigil was for because you see the letters and you're like, oh, yeah, like if you try and like mix, mix them around again, you can kind of figure out what you were originally saying. I think it, for many people, that's easier to do than maybe coming up with like the symbols, essentially. And it also is, in my opinion, like the introductory method of bringing in like sigil creation without getting into all of like the Kameas and the planetary magic stuff. But yeah, like I think it's totally valid and a lot of people really enjoy it. I've seen people create beautiful sigils like from it. Uh, makes me very jealous of some people's artistic abilities. I don't know, Fel, what do you think? 
The witch wheels, I kind of wonder where they came from. I didn't do too much research into them, but they kind of remind me. <laughs> they kind of remind me of puzzle books. Like the ciphers and the logic puzzles. Just because they, they look identical to um, puzzle book ciphers, if you've ever seen them. It's like cryptography. <laughs> yeah. I'll have, to look, I'll have to look into their history. Yeah, I don't know. I they, I mean, they're fine. I just wonder if, uh, where they came from and if someone... I mean, that's a cool idea. I mean, I wonder now if there's other cool symbols I can divine from my mom's puzzle book. Like, who knows? Maybe I'll divine my own magical system. <laughs> or like magic eye books. Like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Listen, do an eye spy book and like pick an item, right? And then just draw like lines from all of the items in the one page. And that's your sigil. But yeah, does anybody have anything else before we close out the episode? Um, just apologies to any psychologists listening to this, any any neuroscientists. Memory is very complicated, and uh, <laughs> I had a bit of a bit of a struggle <laughs> reading through the studies on it. But hopefully, um, you learned something, or at least enjoyed yourself listening to this episode. Yeah, like final thoughts. Memory is complicated. It definitely is. <laughs> like I've. I've interned in like a neurological area with a pharmaceutical company. And I remember even then when I talked to these scientists who like study on a daily basis, they were like, we don't know anything. Like we literally don't know anything. I was like, oh, great. <laughs> great. Good to know. Um, so it is complicated. And it's one of those things where we kind of just accept that it happens and we don't necessarily need to know why to accept that it has influence and power. Um, and that's okay. And if we do ever learn why, that's fantastic. Because like I've said many times in this podcast, I don't like not knowing why things work. My final thoughts? Uh, I don't know. Personally, I think uh, like apotropaic marks or other forms of like images of power, I think they're more interesting. <laughs> or like daisy wheels here in New England or hex signs down in... Um, PA Dutch Pennsylvania uh the, that stuff I mean maybe it has more meaning to me because I'm like from those, those areas but I don't know I would rather engage with symbols that have already like been imbued with the form of power as opposed to creating like a sigil also I would like to clarify because I feel like people people ask me this question a lot they'll be like what is the sigil of Athena and I'm like there I there's not that's nothing that doesn't exist <laughs> so just throwing out there, a lot of the stuff like the sigil of so-and-so is usually modern and not actually historically attested, which is fine if you don't care about that. But yeah, <laughs> just a point of clarification there. I actually have a question. There's this idea that if you continuously use a sigil for a particular working, that it grows in its power of like representation of that particular thing. So if you use the same sigil over and over and over and over for the same kind of working, um, that it just like gets its own kind of additional meaning than what you originally maybe put into it. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I have actually personally done that. Um, I'm not going to like share all the details of that, but I, I basically, I imbued a sigil into a plant is what i will say a very fun thing to do uh did a whole like did it on the planetary hour with the corresponding planetary square it was a it was a whole thing and it worked extremely well and it, it was interesting to see the plant like literally take a life of its own or take a life that sounds terrible no the the plant got oh god the plant turned into a monster no the the plant really took off and had a got a life of its own in a way and, and so the sigil kind of i viewed it as like the plant was taking the sigil and like transforming it into this new thing so I, I have done that, and it was probably one of the most powerful workings I've done. So I think there's merit to that. But it could have also been other things that I did at that time. But yeah. Honey, what do you think? Do you have any? I know you don't use them as much in your practice, but. Yeah, it's interesting because um, it makes me think of um, things like the um, previous sort of struggles to identify like words of power. And I, I think we kind of mentioned really briefly like the anthropological concept of schematas and how these kind of concepts can be communicated through um, societies. So I guess I think about um, 
sigils as highly individualized, but I wonder if they can take on greater meaning. Can that be through sort of um, social communication? Like, can there be be some kind of universal sigil? Can it can it um, communicate a um, a concept that is uh, re- relevant to an entire group? Uh, like, are we are we inventing a sigil or are we discovering a sigil? I know that this isn't this is really more this is more me asking questions and answering them, but I think there's some really interesting um, things to think about in terms of like the collective. I don't want to say collective unconscious because because <laughs> uh, you know why, but um, yeah, I, I think there's something there with the idea of it becoming somewhat of its own thing, but it, it requires it to be um, maybe let out into the world a little bit more. Could you consider it maybe to be like a kind of egregore type? Thing? I was gonna, use, I was gonna use that word. I wasn't, I wasn't quite sure. I was like, mm. but yeah, maybe, um, maybe. But I, I don't know if it's the sigil itself that is the egregore, though, right? Maybe is it the concept? Yeah, the I think it's more the concept. Yeah, the idea behind it. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting thought. I mean, I do think that using a sigil many times for one particular purpose increases its power and I also have like personal experiences that UPG (laughs) um, that kind of solidify that idea just in my own practice but yeah I don't know I do think it's interesting to consider it as like the idea of the concept of the sigil being part of an egregore constantly feeding the concept like the same energy over and over and over it just like grows and grows and grows um, until it becomes like a fully fledged thing of its own but that's more of a chaos magic concept, and I'm not like a chaos, so <laughs> I can only speak to a certain extent on that. Uh, we should have asked Kat that last episode. I will. Okay, that truly was the last part of this episode. We can close it out now. Um, thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate you taking the time. And if you haven't already, you can follow us on Instagram, where we post hints about the upcoming episodes. So if you want to try and figure it out beforehand, um, you usually can if you want to guess, you can do that too. But follow us on Instagram at Test Tubes and Cauldrons. We also have a YouTube channel that we are working on updating. And you can follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you feel inclined to leave a review on Apple Podcasts, please do so. That greatly helps out our platform and um, lets the algorithm know that they should push us out to more people. But other than that, you can find all the papers that we've talked about. We'll have them linked in the episode description if you're so inclined to read them. I will warn you that it's a little mind-boggling, so just go into it knowing that. But other than that, we will see you next week for our next episode. Thanks for listening, everybody, and have a great day.